Okay, we want to do some hot seats here, huh? How would you like to do this, Dory? Do you want some volunteers? or You know how to be fair, that's good. All right, let me get to this. There we go. Okay, if you can put up that slide, we're okay, going to do hot so, seats. Okay, uh, so we, we can call one at a time, okay? Yeah, that's okay. good. You all saw me, I was going in there. Marisa, Marisa. <laughs> You don't have to. Okay, let me explain to you. He's going to be solving whatever problem an organization. If you are not ready and you feel that you want to give your seat to another classmate, you can do that. Okay. Thank you. Let's give Marissa a big hand. Thank you, Marissa. Lucky girl, though. She keeps winning. You go buy a lottery ticket, mate. Carwin Llewellyn, where are you? Do you want to do it, Carwin? Okay, let's go up. Are you going up? Do you want hot seats for your business? I, wait, stop. Hold on, you guys. Don't force anybody. Okay, don't force anybody. Let people make their own choices so that they can really be up there. Carwin, do you? Don't worry about right the mic. Right here, have a seat. Grab the mic. Do you want to be up there, Carwin? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> just one question? No, it's not a question. Here, here's what's going to happen, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to just very briefly describe your business. What do you do? Who, you, who, you, who your customers are? Uh, and what is your biggest challenge right now as you're in your business? So what's your business? What do you do for your customers? And what do you, what's your biggest challenge right now? So what do we do? We are an insurance broker. So we intermediate between the insurance companies and our clients. And in terms of the biggest challenge? First of all, I want to learn a little bit more about who your clients are. Are they businesses? Yep. Are they individual people? Or Yeah, but so it's B2B. So we only focus on business insurance. Okay, so great. Buildings, public liability, that kind of stuff. Great. Yep. And we source the majority of our business through referral partners and existing client base. So what's your biggest challenge right now? What is it? What, does anything keep you up at night? And if nothing keeps you up at night, <laughs> what could you do? What, what would have to happen for you to do double or triple the business you do now? Wow. Okay. So there's a whole bunch of things. So I'm just trying to think whether it would be to do with our scaling would be the biggest thing. We've got a couple of structural bits, but I think in terms of how we, yeah, how we do take to the next level in terms of um, the, we've got six, six employees or six people total. Myself and my business partner, Mark, are very operational. And I guess, so how we get out of that and get more scale quickly, we've got a bit of a few cash flow challenges due to some of the debt that we've got in our business at the moment. Yeah, so I guess we keep tossing up how quickly we can get the debt down to then reinvest back in the business and get some more punters in. Who are the stakeholders in your business? Who else benefits when you're successful? That's an awesome question. Obviously, myself and my partners, but to the other, it's also a joint venture. Our licensee, so there's a licensing regime in Australia, and our licensee owns 50 percent of the operation and we own the other 50 percent okay now that's one operation or their operation in other words uh, one okay. central thing that yeah so we've got one business that holds our client asset or client portfolio they own 50 percent of that and we own the other 50 percent okay and do you work with a group of employees in an office or do you work with independent contractors how do you get most of your work done Yep. Uh, yep, employees. So we've got an office in Brisbane. Right. And uh, yeah, we share that space with some other businesses as well. Okay, and what is it that is the bottleneck in the company that you feel you need to scale it? What is it where are things bottling up? That old adage of time is what are we focusing on? We've got, we have our own client service roles mm -hmm. and we tend to look after the bigger clients, which whilst they bring in more income, are also more demanding. And then we split the operational roles, the HR. Try and find time for all we try. We just do all we do not find time for. Planning and strategy and that kind of stuff. Managing, trying to work. Some of the commentary you've been making about systemization has been resonating massively because our systems are really poorly documented, I would be fair to say. Okay. Now, is everything that you do require somebody who's very knowledgeable on that or there are there pieces of that that you can break off and get to somebody that you can give them a set of instructions and they could quickly do that or within a reasonable time do that. They don't need to be permanent in your organization. Uh, yes is the answer. Oh, sorry. But yes, we have people who are the technical people and client service that re requires a degree of experience and product knowledge and all that kind of stuff. And then there are some more autonomous administration tasks, including keying data and to get quotes out of, out of electronic systems and platforms and stuff like that. Are you familiar with a service by Amazon called Mechanical Turk? I am not. Okay. Can you take notes, mate? Can I just interrupt for one second? Yep. Class, I hardly see anybody taking notes. This man is asking the most magnificent questions that you want to ask your customers, you want to ask your client. If you're not interested in doing it, train somebody to do it. It is absolutely brilliant. Just write as quickly as you can. But it's, this is not a time to be watching. It's not how the brain works. Unless you have a very special savant kind of brain, you are not going to remember all of this. It, so it's, these are brilliant questions that he's asking. So this is a good time to be taking notes. I just want to support you with that. All right? Did you have a question? Mechanical, like in a mechanic, right? Mechanical Turk, T-U-R-K. Okay, okay, thank it, you. All right. And it, if you don't understand, do raise your hand. Great question. Thank you. It's a service by Amazon. And what they do is they have a, a network all over the world. 
that any task that needs to get done, they have an ability to identify an appropriate person with the right skill sets because you're going to help them identify that person. And then on a temporary basis, they'll bid to do your project for you. Okay? And because it comes from all over the world, those bids come very low. So if you have re repeating type work that you don't have to be an internal member of your organization to get done, yep. if you can segregate those out and then work with that me mechanical Turk structure to get those done, you'll find it very efficient, very inexpensive, and a great relief on the people whose focus and time you do need in, in your organization. It's just a service that you ought to be familiar with and just check it out on the internet. They'll tell you about themselves when you go in there and uh, check them out. But it's just a really great service and it, you, a lot of the work ends up getting done in the Philippines, for example, where they speak great English, so you don't have any communication problems with speaking English. And you got people there that work for two to three or four dollars an hour and thrilled to do it. Thrilled to do it. So if you can take those and break out those tasks, that could be saving you money, saving your people's key time. All right, so that's one area where you, it would help you to do that. Have you ever done anything like an exercise to map? Because that's what we did here, is we mapped the projects of our business. In other words, everything's a project, even administration is a project. And once you put it into where it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, it's now finite. It's no longer this fuzzy thing that keeps on going that nobody has any real control over. Even in accounting, you have month beginning, month end. You close your books at the end of the year. There's certain things you do to mark milestones. So everything, between, everything is either a milestone or a goal. So the goals are set and you map out, just like we did here, all the task sets that get you from this milestone to that milestone and you assign them out. See, when you, do, when you start to do that, you take control of your business. Your business is no longer this thing that's, that, that keeps you awake at night. You actually are in command because it's all mapped and you know exactly what to do with it. What do you do to get your clients? Tell me about that. Yep, so we, of course, our existing clients will refer to us. We do we have some strategic partnerships that we run with accounting firms and other people who are influencers, as well as some general networking. How do those people bring you into the business? In other words, you say it's like a referral partner. Yep. How is it that they deliver the prospect to you? Yep. So normally it's by an introduction. For example, with one of the partnerships we've got, we go and or I go and see them once once a week. It was once a fortnight, but it's going to be once a week shortly when I get back. And then we sit down with the managers within that business. They've got their accounting firm, they've got multi tiers, and we sit down with the client managers and the accountants that sit under them have a conversation with them about what's going on with their clients. It's like maybe five, ten minutes, that kind of stuff. Because we don't want to take up too much of their time. But then if they identify an opportunity, then they will do an introductory email or at least send us the data so it's a prospect as opposed to just a lead and yeah and then we'll make contact with them from there. Okay so at what point are you making the contact? Who's doing that preliminary? The account. So we don't make contact with the prospect until we get delivered the introduction. And, and how do they introduce you? Well, we did give them, we haven't given them a formal template as such but that's usually Hi Cowan, they'll copy in the client, can you please give Braden Caulfield a ring, he's got and needs some PO insurance and, and then they might say hey, Braden Cowan's the expert that we use in this space. Okay this may not be a number that you know but how many of those preliminary prospect talks happen to generate the first introduction to you? Is it two or three? Is it 10 or 12? Is it 20 or 30? Uh, how many conversations is the accountant having with that person before they introduce it to me? And yeah, I have no idea. Okay, when I say not just one, but for example, if I talk to two potential prospects for you, and every time I talk to two, one of them turns out to be a good introduction, that's a lot different than if I'm talking to 20 or 30 to have one be a good introduction to you. So you may not know that number, but do you? No, and actually, I think it would be interesting if they were talking to 20 or 30, because the, the deal flow is certainly not for the size of business, this particular one. There's a lot lower than what we would be expecting. In fact, we've got some accountants that are a quarter of their size, yeah. and they refer to us as much business. So one of the things is we're okay. looking to engage. What would happen if you put some energy into refining the process that starts with your introducer, with your introducer, and how they get their prospects, and what they say to their prospects, and how they turn them over to you? And let me tell you why I ask that question, because every one of those nexus points is an opportunity to improve the results that they're getting and that you're getting. Now, you compensate these people when you actually do business? Uh, yes, we do. Okay. So they got a stake in being better at this. Right? Yep. Okay. As a marketing guy, I know that the way in which you approach somebody and what it is your storyline is and how it is you build up the expectation of how great the solution is going to be for somebody bears a lot on how many people you have to talk to before they want to be introduced. The way you build that story has a big difference in once they're introduced, how respectful they are of you and appreciative of the fact that they have this great opportunity to even speak to you because you're so in demand for what you do. That's all a function of the introduction, okay? If I were in your shoes, I would invest some time and some energy into sitting down with my sources and asking them, how do you do this? 
what do you do? Because I'm going to help you be better at this, okay? And then you let them tell you their story. Let them tell you their numbers and say to them, in other words, guys, if I can improve this for you so that instead of talking to seven people to get me an introduction, you only have to talk to two. And if every two that you introduce to me, because of the way you introduce me, gets for every two you introduce gets a sale as opposed to every three or five get a sale. Wouldn't it make sense for us to spend a few hours together to get this process down really tight? Okay. If again, if I were in your shoes, I'd get a hold of a really good marketer. Is Steve here? I don't know if Steve's in the room. Steven. Oh, yeah. right. Anyway, I call him and I tell him that, look, I got these guys that introduced me, right? I have a sense that process could be really embellished and, and magnified and let him spend a little time talking to you about that because if you get them doing this the right way, telling the right story, building your credentials before they ever meet you, where their story that they're telling creates such a demand for you that they have to meet you and you have instant credibility the moment that you talk to them. That's worth gold. You, you follow? Because your job gets really easy after that, okay? And the amount of money that flows to everybody gets really a lot more than it is today. So I, just from what you told me, that to me would be the prime focus I, I would take in your business, is to fix that, ta that uh, pathway between what the introducer has to do to get the prospect wanting to speak to you and the story that they tell that builds an expectation that when they talk to you, they're lucky that they have the opportunity because the things that you're going to do for them are something that so few people in your field can do that, that you're in demand and that, in fact, if it, I don't even know for sure I can get you in, right? Okay. But he's a real good, he, he works really well with us. We have a lot of sway with him. And if we can get you in there, it's just an interview you'd like to have. In other words, how they phrase things, how they word things makes a huge difference in their expectation when they meet you and their resistance to a sale when they meet you. And that's a place where I, would, I think I'd put a lot of energy to really you notice a significant difference in your business. If you can offload some of your work to people who can do that kind of work and just knock it out inexpensively and quickly through a good organization like Mechanical Turk, which is, you know, it's an Amazon company. And by the way, I'm just going to give you an aside. Amazon has the most brilliant business plan in the world. Most brilliant. When they went into the e-commerce business, they figured out they were going to be a leader in the field. And they figured out that anything that they needed to have or do in the way of facilitation to be an e-commerce company, every other e-commerce company coming along behind them would need it too. So they went into it with the idea that what they would do is they would have no cost centers in their company. Every Everything would be a profit center. So anything that they had to do for themselves that should have been a cost center, they set it up as a business to do it for other e-commerce companies. And so that's why you can go into Amazon and they have Mechanical Turk. Why? Because they needed temporary help. So they had to solve this problem for themselves. And they said, well, we're solving it for ourselves. Let's sell it once we set it up. Okay? They had to create data storage. So they said, let's set it up for ourselves and then let's sell it. We'll use more data storage. We'll have more economies of scale. We'll not only make money by selling it instead of it being a cost to us, but we'll drive all of our costs down anyway. So they took every single thing they had to do to be an e-commerce company and they made it into something they sell. Now, why should you know that? So you should know that because you have IP in your business right now that you don't even think about. It's things that you've had to do in order to overcome certain challenges of getting your business up and running and profitable and all of that stuff. And I'd encourage you to take a look at what have you done for yourself that if other businesses knew how to do that, they'd be a step ahead of the game, okay? And how could you market that through some little internet flyer or internet book or internet or ebook or something like that to solve problems for not your competitors necessarily, but for other companies that just have the same problem that you did and it would pay you five, 10, 20, 30 bucks just to solve that problem. Because do you know how many entrepreneurs there are in the United States, for example? At any given time, there's 2 million. If you penetrate 10% of that market, that's 200,000 sales. If you, if you do 1% of the market, that's 20,000 sales, okay? And it's something you've already done for yourself. So think about intellectual property that you have and how you can market that to other people. It's really worth it. It's like free money once you get it out on the internet. Anyway, is there anything else I can help you with? Is there anything that you've got me saying, that you can say to me, Gordon, I got this thing that keeps me up at night. I got to get it solved. No, I was just thinking how lucky I'm given the fact that you just saved me a massive conversation later down the track. And plus, on top of that, all the gems you gave me last night. So I've just had the double whammy. I'm stoked. All right. So you're a happy guy? Is yeah, yeah. Well, let's give him a big Ooh. hand. Okay. <laughs> Who's who? the next lucky boy or girl? I want to talk to somebody who stays up at night worrying about their stuff. Okay. Let's see if the next <laughs> Han So Ng. A big problem, you stay up at night, okay? How you doing? By the way, the slide that you, whoops, uh, that you might want to have up is the very last one on my, on okay. my, on my right. slides there. It just, it deals with hot seats. Nope, last one. Anyway, while they're doing that. What kind of business are you in? So I have two businesses. One is a sales training company, and the other one is a general corporate training company. Talk to that guy. Right over there. He needs some sales training for his uh, referrers. Anyway, I'm sorry, go ahead. So you have sales training business, and what else? And corporate training business. And corporate training. So corporate the difference training. is sales training, we only provide, we only train salespeople and sales managers. The other company actually tr provide trainers that is not a hired buyers, but we it's on a project basis. So if we secure a deal from a big company, we outsource to all these trainers. So that's a new company, just started this year. The sales training is branded Sales Ninja. It's a 10-year-old company. So we synergize among these two companies. Right. All right. Now, if you were to take either one of the companies, take either one, is there one of those companies that has what you feel is a major challenge that you're just having some difficulty overcoming that particular challenge? 
Okay. The new one. Right? Okay. The new you can one. Take either one. The new one is like everybody else. So I'm trying to find a positioning. So what keeps me at night is I have not found a position. What is the best strategy to make it different from all our training providers? Because training provider business is just too easy to start. Everybody can start from their home and they're competing against us because they know some trainers, they can go approach a client as well. So the differentiation is difficult for us. So I, I have not found the, the right statement that says, you know what, this is our USP and boom, it beats the rest. Okay. So let me ask you this. Put yourself in your client's shoes. Okay. Who would be a typical client for you? Who, who would be a, if you were designing an avatar is like your perfect client, you're describing them, you know, what they look like, feel like, touch like, taste like. What would a, a perfect perfect avatar client for that business be, what would they look like? 50 employees and above, believes in training, has a training budget, gives all training budget to one company. Avatar, right? I'm That's good. I mean, this is what you're looking for, right? Yeah. So gives all budget to one company, demands good service, wants to build personal relationship instead of just hit my KPI kind of HR director. What else? Okay. I didn't Stop. hear the most important one I'd look for. Results? No. No? No. I, the, in my avatar. Okay. So if anybody's designing an avatar for your business, listen to this. Okay. I didn't hear the word pain point one time. Okay. When I look for a client, I look for a client where I can identify a pain point that they have that keeps them up at night. That if I can solve that pain point, they have to have me. Okay. And I position myself in their eyes as the solver of that pain point. If you were to take your perfect client, give me an example of a particular company that might be a client. Actually, any company that has a training need analysis is a client. So if you're a small one... Just maybe... give me an example of a business. Just pick a business, a specific okay. type of so business. So we, we just closed a deal one month ago. It's a manufacturer. They do paper manufacturing. They manufacture paper, all kinds of paper. Okay. So. All right. So they're a manufacturer of paper and they're an ideal client for all the reasons that you just... Ideal. They're a good client, right? Perfect. Okay. Good client to have because of all the things you said that before that you look for as you are in your avatar. All right. What do you suppose keeps that manufacturer, the owner of that manufacturing co company, what do you suppose keeps him up at night? Because he asked you to come in for a reason, okay? He just didn't invite you in to be this trainer because he has no issues. So what was his biggest concern? What were the concerns that company had that they wanted you to solve? So in this case, there's a 300 packs team building, which I outsource to the team builders. It's just a team building to them. So it doesn't want to solve specific problems. It's just, oh, this is our annual training budget for team building. And they awarded us because we found a good match of trainers for them. Pain point is just like, don't screw up. Make sure they're happy. They're united. They start understanding the company's vision as a value systems, all this okay. kind of stuff. Okay. What you just described to me is the kind of client that probably everybody who goes into the consulting business looks for, okay? And so you're always gonna have some competition finding those guys, and you're gonna have to worry about the competition because you, you picked a plain vanilla guy who's got plain vanilla problems. What if you went a, one step beyond that and you start to look for a range of specific problems that certain businesses have, that the minute you mention that you can fix that problem, they're on board, they gotta have this. And I'll try and maybe help think some of that through. Suppose, for example, that I've got a situation in a company where I've got half a dozen managers and each one of them has big egos. And each one of them thinks that they're the ruler of the roost. And these guys can't get along worth a darn, but, they, but they're too important. I can't fire any one of them. I got to work with them. But if I could get these guys working together, I'd be a really, I'd be ecstatic, okay, with all my problems. All right. So now if I put out a prospecting letter or a prospecting email where I direct it to businesses with that specific problem, most of them throw my email in the trash. If you can throw an email in the trash, I guess you push delete. <laughs> but now somebody reads that. Okay, and says, my gosh, if this guy can solve my intermanager relations problems, I gotta have this guy, okay? There isn't anybody else who's gonna get that job but you. And it doesn't matter if they've hired consultants in the past or not, because you hit a pain point. You hit something that keeps the owner of that business up at night. Again, if I were in your shoes, what I'd be doing is I'd be looking at the scope of the consulting business that I do. I'd look at the prospects that are out there for that business, and I would start to identify what could be pain points that I could fix for them, and then I would market to those pain points. Because when you do that, you are creating a client who has to have you. They're gonna, they're gonna say, where have you been? Why didn't you come to me before? As opposed to 100 guys went to him before and you're fighting that stream all the time because everybody's looking for plain vanilla who's already got the budget, who's already gonna do it, or any, and everybody wants that guy, okay? Whereas there are guys out there that are hungry for you who don't even, haven't even thought about a consultant, but the minute you tell them what you can do for them, they gotta have it. See, when I told the story of, the, of what this scale force can do, I tell that story to people in presentations all the time. And the response I get is, where have you been? I, this solves all my problems in my business. You've solved all the problems I've been wrestling with for years. I, I had no idea how to organize this thing to take care of it. Got it. It's all automated, okay? Because there's a pain point that everyone has in running a business, and it's called scaling it. They're not equipped to do it. They don't know how to do it. They don't have the right skill sets to do it. But yet everyone knows it has to be done, but they won't take the time to do it. And they're disinterested in that process that even though that process would cure a lot of problems for them, they won't do it.
okay, because it just doesn't fit them. It's not what they do. So you want to be able to go to a, a head of a business and be able to show them, I can do for you what you can't do for yourself, okay? I can solve your biggest problem that you have here in this company, which is, and then if, I, if you do your list right, you've got a list of at least five to 10 things that are serious pain points in a business management structure. And you gear your whole presentation around solving those pain points. And I guarantee you, you do that, you will be unstoppable in the marketplace because people have to have you. You're like Bayer Aspen, man. I got a headache and I ain't gonna sleep tonight unless I get my Bayer Aspen or Advil, I guess is the new one. So you wanna be Advil. Okay, does that help you any in terms of, of, of thinking how to maybe crack those markets a little bit better? Yeah, so basically, I, I, well, my understanding is just find the key pain points, just specialize in those key points. And, and your marketing approach specializes in those pain points, okay? And, and your approach tends to focus in on them. Because that's, in other words, again, there are two things that sell people anything, okay? One is benefit, okay? If I know how I'm gonna benefit, I like to benefit, I'll buy it. Another way people buy stuff is I'm in pain, and I gotta have this thing that'll stop my pain. I'd rather sell pain relief all day long than benefits. Why? Because I'm talking to somebody that has to deal with me, has to have it, has to have it right now, as opposed to, oh, it's a great benefit. Uh, let's talk next week. I, I can get the benefit next week, that's fine. Can I clarify a question? Sure. So my client, my target market are all people with pain points. It's here's the budget, here's the TNA, training analysis. I need leadership for supervisors. I need finance for non-finance. I need ISO training. So they come with a list of, here's what I want. Help me find these things. The target market already have created their pain points mm -hmm. and it passes to us and we go match it with trainers mm -hmm. and deliver the service. Okay, now for each pain point, do you have a set presentation that if that's their pain point, here's what I go, for. here's what I say to them, here's how I set it up so that they are aware of that pain point, that they, that they know they have it and that they know they need a solution and that they know by what I tell them that my solution will work for them, okay? Because that's what each pain point should have around it, okay? So now we have the pain point and now we have the, the, the copy that tells us how we word it, how we, you're, you're familiar with something called neuro-linguistic programming? Okay, how you say something is as important as what you say. Okay, and the one place that most businesses don't put enough energy in is into the marketing concept by which they're gonna get their business. In other words, they, they, they tend to get a little lazy about it, okay? And it's just, well, talk to people, tell them what I do. It's not enough to tell people what you do. You've gotta bring in their mind the pain point they have up to the surface so that they're looking at it right in their face. And then they gotta see how you solve that for them. And all of a sudden it connects. Why they gotta hire you, not the guy down the street, but you, because you're so focused on it. You understand them, you resonate with their pain. You understand what that pain is and how to fix it and how to cure it for them. The minute they believe that's true of you, they will buy you and they'll buy what you have to offer them. Okay, does that help any? Don't say yes if it doesn't. If I wanna get you to where you see how to move yourself forward a little bit on that. I got a question from Real. That day I was sitting at dinner, so you asked me, is Michael Gerber said this? Oh, sorry, Michael Gerber's question is this. It's like, what would be almost impossible in your industry that if you solve it, you will be like dominating the market? I think it's a good question. Right. And she asked the same question. It's like, what's the pain point of my client? So basically these HR directors have three key pain points of any companies, Canon or some large companies. No one is understanding their own problems for the company because they gotta talk to the HOD, find out the problem with their departments, create a list of training programs for their departments. Pain point number one. Pain point number two is, all right, let's find a provider that can find trainers that is able to solve these problems. So that's pain point number two. And pain point number three, what is the results? So these guys need to present charts to the boss that says, you know what, I just spent 150 grand on a team building and boom, this is the improvements. Here's the communications improvement. So they need to show tangible results to their board or to their management team. So that's pain point number three. They need to show results. So I thought of these three key pain points and I thought, okay, if I can do these three, I'll, that, that should be the position yeah. Cool. Thoughts? Okay, and have you followed through that through on that? Oh, no, the coaching was like two nights ago or something. Oh, you haven't got time then. But the, yeah, there's, there's a lot to that. But the main thing is, again, I find in the things that I do, I, I want to identify pain points, okay? Scaling a business, which is one of the reasons I chose this, is a big pain point to people. They go, they, they spend their whole business careers trying to scale their businesses and don't. And it's a tremendous, it's a measure of tremendous frustration. Anyway, we're getting the time sign here, so we're going to have to quit Enzo here, but so hopefully- I'm, I'm so, so going to borrow some workbooks, yeah. Okay, anyway. Thank you. Oh. Yes, let's give him a big hand. Come on, you guys. Everybody, a real quiet stretch. Everybody stand so we can be a little bit awake. Just be quiet. Everyone to your right, everyone to your left. Gently back, gently forward. No, it's not who I pick. It's whatever the luck is. Okay. Oh, you need a little break? I'm not asking you guys. I'm asking the teacher. Do you need a little break? Do you I need, need a little break? break? I don't need a break. No, let's sit down, you guys. Unless you want to start late, your tray show. Thank you. Okay? All right, so, we're going to do more. <laughs> yes. He's just taking a little walk. Yeah, hey, that's my break. If you need to go to the restroom, you can, but I wouldn't if I were you, Jeff. Jeff Hoare. Where are you, Jeff? All right, thank you. Hey, Jeff. Good to see you up here. All right, you know the drill by now, right? Tell us a little bit about your business. Three companies, three businesses. First one, had for 10 years. Solar business doing domestic commercial systems. Second business, electrical contracting business. 
15 staff, that sort of stuff in that business. Third business, which is a new business, is I've partnered with the electrical business I've got is a part of the franchise network and I partnered with the franchise owner to start this new business, which is basically taking my solar business and I've systemized it, but it needs to be better and rolling that out to the other 53 franchises all around the country. Mm -hmm basically going from a local regional business to now a business with a national footprint. And that's the new one? That's the new one. Oh, so, national footprint, the new one. That's pretty good. <laughs> and it comes with um, supplying product, sales training, and that sort of stuff with it. So a few challenges. Okay, pick the biggest one. We want to go for the, the mother load here. The mother load. The biggest issue for me in the last few years has been me, mm -hmm. meaning I need to get out of the way of myself and stop trying to do too much. Yeah, I, I, my first question was going to be about focus, but that's... Yeah. Um, <laughs> This new venture you've got, I can see a lot of benefit in mm -hmm. that for me. The thing, the issue I've got is we run, the electrical business runs on one software platform, the solar business runs on another software platform, having everything integrate together without double, triple handling, and then to introduce a new mm -hmm. platform, the integration between them needs to work. The software we use for the electrical business is super complex, like more complex than it needs to be, it's a product called Simpro. Starting this new business, we're running it through QuickBooks, which is good from an accounting point of view, but it's not good from a job that's tracking and everything right, else right, point of view. It doesn't help you administer the business, is no. what it doesn't do. Your new product helps a lot. We've been writing systems, writing videos, all right. that sort of stuff. All of that stuff is in a Google Drive folder that my staff can access when they need it. It's not the hand holding that that sort of product. Yeah, this just makes it simpler to get the right thing at the right time quickly in the hands of the right the, person. The thing is that things have got to talk to each other. So well, You're familiar with, in computer lingo with something called an API, right? Yeah. Okay, so what our people do, for example, is we, we even do this in our beta group where they want to integrate it with QuickBooks. They want to in integrate it with a, co with a company called Salesforce, which they use as their CRM. Yeah. So we have our developer write API so that in the places where it would be helpful for the two systems to talk to each other, and give each other information they do. Yeah. Our whole system is based on you, you, you put in any data once, and after that, every form you get that calls up that situation is pre-populated with all the stuff the computer knows about that person, about that company, about that deal that's necessary for that particular application. It would do the same thing through an API, for example, so that if the information is in QuickBooks, it'll suck it out and put it in this system. If the information is the other place, it'll send it the other way. It, anyway, I don't want to get into a lot of discussion about that, but that's a good point that systems have to talk to each other. But look, what's your, in other words, I'm still trying to get at the heart of what your big challenge is. What is it that you want to see? What, first of all, what's the obstacle that's holding you back? What's stopping you from being twice as big this time next year as you are today. And pick one company, otherwise we'll drive ourselves nuts here. The solar business as it currently stands, looking after the, the regional area that we do, we've got about 100,000 people and it's maxed out. We sell high-end product, there's lots of bikes selling them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't class the other guys as competition. I look at myself as the market leader in my region and there's, I'll, walk, I'll walk out of a client's house when we start negotiating on price. Meaning I don't drop my price, that's it. And they can go and buy it cheaper mm -hmm. elsewhere because I'm not about price. I think the, I've started a new sales team in that business to keep me out of it so I can concentrate on other stuff. I think where I need my help right now is with the new venture and building it right so that I can sit on a yacht in the Mediterranean. <laughs> Mediterranean's got a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of call to it. Yeah. What I'm trying to do is to get to a specific challenge that you got. In other words, I'm trying to get you to drill down a little bit and say, what's at the, what's at the heart of a particular challenge that I've got? Because if you can get down to the root cause of something, solving it's easy. The problem is there's all this clutter around the challenge. And you think it's a little bit of this and a little of that, and it isn't. It's usually one thing that's right at the core of all of it. And if you can get away all of the, the chaff, the wheat's down there somewhere. And once you find the wheat, it's really easy to solve the problem. I think the biggest problem I got sitting in the chair. <laughs> I don't know. We had somebody here earlier who could probably help you with that one. Yeah. Why, why do you say that? I think it's got to be right. They've got to be perfect to a point. Perfection is the enemy of the good. Don't understand. Okay, because if it's got to be perfect, it keeps you from having things that are good, and good is really good. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. and to get from here to good, okay, takes a certain amount of energy and focus. To get to perfect, this last little piece, takes five times the effort as it took to get from here to there. Yeah. Okay, and good gets you outgoing and profitable. Perfection usually doesn't add that much more profit, okay, and it's much more time consuming. That's why most businesses don't try to be perfect. They try to be good. And in fact, they want to be a little bit better than their competition, but if they're smart, they just take a better business model or better business strategy and use that to get them where they want to go, but never try to be perfect or good. In other words, the scale force model, I can think of hundreds of things that I could do to make it perfect. Yeah. Okay, but it's going to take me 100 years to do yeah. that. Okay, and by then it's not of any use to anybody. So I can't, there's a classic duel in most businesses between a sales team and an engineering team. The engineering team wants it to be perfect. They don't want to introduce it until it's perfect, okay? And then the sales team says, look, just give me the damn product. I got to get it into the marketplace. I can sell the hell out of this thing. Okay, why, are we why aren't we releasing it? 
okay? And it's a classic conflict that goes on all the time. I, my suspect is you're an analytical personality, and that's part of what it is with an analytical person, is it's gotta be perfect. As opposed to the promoter who says, close is good enough, right? Again, let's just get it out there. We can sell it and get it going. Now, a good CEO balances that and takes it to where the product is saleable, good, can do what it's supposed to do, is I'm gonna be a minimal of returns, and it now meets the needs of the sales force is gonna get take it out and go with it. But that's the job of the CEO is to figure out that balance between those two parties. But do you have any partners? I need my wife, yeah. Pardon? I need my wife. Oh, just your wife. Yeah. Uh, what personality style is she? But there are uh, four. Yeah, you know so four? I'm a high D with a bit of C. Uh -huh. And she's high high S. Oh, so you balance. Yeah, yeah. Right, real good okay. together. And she probably has an argument about you all the time about it being perfect, right? Not so much. In business it's it's business and me being a high D on the boss and <laughs> that's <laughs> that's why you don't have arguments because no, okay, that, you got it. <laughs> that changes when we get home though. Yeah, no, that don't in the sense when truly really embedded. Okay, the, let me ask you this. Would you rather be right or would you rather be rich? Yeah. No, there's no yeah to that. Yeah, I'm realizing that I need to not be right. <laughs> yeah, and that's a question that everybody in business has to come to at some point or another. There's a certain point where you can be perfect or you can be rich. You can't be both. Okay, it's just they don't go together. Okay, the only time they go together is if you're Picasso or. You're going to be dead first. <laughs> yeah, no, you still have to be dead first before, yeah, yeah. They, before they really respect you. It's a good answer. But the point I'm trying to get to is, and I think you know it already, it sounds like you're, you're aware of this. But again, I'm trying to not just solve the psychological side of how you master what you're doing. I, I want to see if I can get to a specific business challenge that you have. And, and I'm having a hard time getting it down to, is it a marketing challenge? Is it a production challenge? Is it a process challenge? Is it a personnel challenge? What part of the business is this manifesting itself in that if you could fix it, you'd be way ahead of the game? Staff's always an issue. Okay, so how is the staff an issue? How? Well, maintaining a high quality and keeping that accountable. A lot of the staff we got now are trained by us, meaning so that they've been apprentices, that sort of thing coming through. We have a bit of a retention problem because we just from price, meaning we compete where I am in Queensland is a very heavy coal mining industry and they can get twice as much work and shift out on the coal than what they can working for me in town. And when you got a crew of young blokes, they chase the dollar. So rather than sitting on a roof, putting solar panels on, they're out there in an air conditioned cab getting twice as much money. The, uh, an issue we've got is retention. We put them through their apprenticeship, they stay for another 18 months, two years, and then they chase the bigger dollars out in the field. All right, is that, do you believe that there's any way to solve that problem? They generally come back. Uh -huh. And what's their story when they come back? The week on stuff, week on, out in the middle of nowhere with nothing to do, mm -hmm. to, to come back home. Okay, so they're earning twice as much for in, in half the time, meaning mm. they, they work a week, earn twice as much, then they earn nothing. They work a week, earn twice as much, and then they earn nothing. Yeah. Sounds like they'd be make more working for you. No, they're on pretty good. Yeah, so they, they work for me and get 70 grand and go out there and they're on a couple hundred, and that's the problem. Okay, all right. If you can't fight them, join them, right? So let's assume that's gonna be, remain an ongoing problem, and that's not gonna change. People are still gonna do what they do. They're gonna go for the higher bucks. They're gonna be enticed by the more money, and that's gonna go on forever. So now how do you solve the problem? We've tried in the last couple of years in particular to increase the business, improve the culture, and make it with, make it more of a family atmosphere that, so that they're more part of the family rather than a hired employee as such. It works to a point, but... But not against the big money. Exactly. Okay, so now, the big money's always gonna draw them away. Some will come back. They're gonna be in, they're gonna be out. So it sounds to me like you've got a rotating labor force. It comes in, comes out, comes and goes, new people all the time. All right, that says to me that you have to have a highly fluid way of working with these people, that when they do come and go, you still are able to use them efficiently, okay? And what that means is a very effective training program. Systems. Systems that, that they fall into right away. They're trained easily and quickly to do what they need to do. They're there for however long they're there, then it's goodbye. It's okay, you can leave, because we got this guy over here, we're gonna hire him. He's new, he's never done this before, but in three days we're gonna have him right up to speed. And you don't worry that this guy left, you got this guy coming in. Yeah. Okay, and your whole system of hiring has to be built around that simple fact that you're not gonna keep them. You can't, you, in other words, there are certain things in the world you can fight, and you're telling me you can't fight this. It's difficult, yeah. Okay, yeah, but I'm not hearing difficult. I'm hearing you really can't fight it because they're gonna go for the money. Yeah, and in, in the last, the, the coal, the price went down a few years ago and the price has come back and all of the monsters started hiring again, and that's where right. we're losing good talent. Okay, now, what do you do to dissuade them from working at the mine? An, an example is you have a certain amount of time where you could actually work on their heads, right? Yeah. Okay, they're working for you. And so you could start with a little bit of programming going on of why it's not a good thing to work at the mine, okay? Are there health issues out there? They sit in big trucks, basically. Air conditioned cabs and take loads of dirt, but it's only a temporary thing because machines will do that soon. Yeah, but they don't care. They want to make the money today. Mm. So you either got to come to terms with the fact that this is a permanent condition, there's nothing you can do about it, except arrange for your own capabilities to bring them in quick, get them trained, get them working productively, and then know they're going to leave soon, okay? And mm. build your business model around the fact that's your labor force, okay? Because if you can't fight them, you gotta deal, you gotta have a way to effectively deal with it. There's only the two choices. You either have a way to, to stop it or you have to have a way that you roll with it.
okay? And it sounds to me like you don't have a way to stop it. I'm not hearing that there's a way to no. stop it. So it means that the efficiency of your business is the, your ability to get them, train them, have them productive very quickly, and when they leave, when they come back, you don't care because your system is built around training new guys and getting them up to speed really quick. Okay, so then it's just part of the, it's like gravity. It's just there. It's just part of the, what you live with every day. We should be looking and focusing on that more rather than trying to build culture and trying to keep them with a good culture. Uh, unless you're finding culture beats money, I'm saying that it doesn't. I've never seen it happen. No. Not to young people. No. To an older person with a little bit of wisdom, maybe. Yeah. Okay, but to a young person, until I want the, the bucks. Until they got kids there. Yeah, right. Okay, so anyway, I noticed they gave me the time sign, but I, I really would think that the thing you ought to focus on is not trying to build some esoteric reason why they should stay that they're not going to have a lot of respect for. They're going to be there for the money. Be real about that. Structure your business so it's easy to bring them in, easy to train them, quick get them up to speed, that you have a supervisory policy that watches them closely when they first come in so that they don't make too many mistakes and you have a little bit of mentoring that goes on in the beginning. In other words, think through what does it take to get these guys up to speed and get them productive very quickly. And then when they leave, and, and you, one of the things you might do is make sure you have a good communication with them so that you're constantly sending them an email or something that says, how's it going for you out in the mines out there? You're tired of, the, yeah, you're tired of being out there by yourself. Come on back here. We want you. We need you. We think you're great. Okay, that kind of thing might help get them back quicker. Okay, but if they're going to go for the money, they're going to go for the money. So your system has to get them in, train, supervise well, get them out. Okay. Let's give them a big hand. Woo! Okay, class. Okay, so we'd like to have a woman up there. I'm getting lots of flack from the back. So what I can do is I can pull a names until I get a woman. Is that okay? I don't ever <laughs> cheat. I don't cheat because if I do, then are these your notes? Whose notes are these? Oh. Let me ask a question, if I can, of, the, of everybody here. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Okay. How's this working for you so far? Are you relating to any of it? Thank you. I, I just want to make sure we're connecting in a way where you start to see, he's got my problem. Or they've got a problem similar to mine. And yet taking that as a possibility makes some sense for me. If, if you're getting that much out of it, then I'm a happy guy because okay. I want to know that it's connecting with you, at least at that level. Is it, do you want to pick a particular woman? Do you want a particular... Okay. So there is a particular woman that wants to go because I'm finding nothing but dudes around here. All right. Yeah, let's go up there. Yeah. Our heroine. <laughs> Lovely to meet you too. Okay, and you are Lucy. Yes. Hi, I'm Gordon Lucy. Hi Gordon, is this, this is working? It's <laughs> lovely to meet you, yes. Well, thank you, thank you. So tell me about your business. What's your business? We have two hospitality brands that we franchise, one called Lone Star Cafe and Bar, which is not the American one. It was one that we started in New Zealand 30 years ago and with our business you, partners. You, you don't, does she look old enough to have started anything 30 years ago? Okay, Go ahead. Thank you. And then the other one <laughs> is a, an all-day cafe called Joe's Garage. Huh. I, I've really loved hearing what you've taught us in the last couple of days. Right. And my concern is that the franchise model, because these are all businesses are franchised, is that is the franchise model is potentially not working or the way it is currently structured it's not working right i think uh, you know we've got some really wonderful franchisees but we've got some very difficult ones and that let's take a difficult one okay why are they difficult what well, is it about them that makes them difficult i think they have i don't think we probably onboarded them very well i think we potentially we... don't take the blame okay. what is the problem what are they coming back to you with that's, that's creating a, difficult, a difficulty for you. It's always about the money. Okay, yeah. so they have to pay you money as a franchise mm -hmm. fee. Yes. And the system is set up, what determines what they pay? Sales? Yes. Okay, so it's totally built around sales. Yes. All right, and the excuse for not paying the money is what? Or they, not wanting to pay the money is yeah. what? Yeah. I think what happens is that we have the system set up, but when they don't follow the systems, then that's our fault. After a few years, everyone always starts off really well because they have a lot of support in the early days, and so they're happy. And then as time goes on and they're successful and they think that it's actually more about them than about the brand, and it's, this is fairly normal in franchising. Right. We've, okay, so you find that's an industry-wide thing. That's mm -hmm. not just you, right? Yes. So it's not yeah, your fault. And there's books written on it, so we've read the books and stuff like that. All right, that. now, so what could you do so that they felt eminently more supported even in their later years? What, what could you do that would give them that feeling? That's what I wanted to talk to you about because okay. I'm thinking the strategic aggregation, I right. think, is, would be a system that would work really well. So that right. they, because the other thing that we find really upsetting, we've, we were people who started the business and then the franchising part of it came later. And we were people who treated our, our suppliers, we loved our staff. We actually really loved the business in the right. early days. And so it was a very positive business. And we get upset when some of our franchisees are rude to the suppliers and oh, not yeah. treating their staff well enough. And, right. it's, and so, of course, you want to say something and then that mm. doesn't generally go very well. Okay. I'm going to share with you an experience that I don't know if it translates exactly, mm -hmm. but it's close. Okay, we had a, a care home company in the UK, and we had eight care homes that each had uh, anywhere from 30 to 100 beds in each of the care homes. And the government sets the price, so you only have so much money to work with. And when we first bought the homes, there was a group of them that had managers that were very upset with the new owners. Okay. Okay, and there was almost like a revolt in the city. And we did a little research of trying to find out what was not going right. And I coached uh, the guy who I work with there on what to do about it, and it worked really well. And I want to share with you what it was, because maybe there's a parallel.
parallel to this. The first thing I told him was, is look, anybody's life is all about them. They really don't care about you. They don't care about me. They don't care about the homes. They care about how everything works for them. And people work at anything, whether it's a job or a profession, because there's certain things they get back from it, part of which is money. But when they've done surveys as to why do people work, what do they respond best to, what creates the greatest morale in a group, it's generally not money. Money is there, but it's recognition. Recognition is the number one thing that people work for. They want to be recognized. They want to be heard. They want to feel like they matter. They want to feel like they're important to you and that you recognize that. The minute you have a problem with people, generally that's at the heart of it, okay, is that they're not feeling those things. What I said to him is, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out there, I want you to call a meeting of the manager and all the staff, and I want you to tell them, look, we're new owners, and we want you to know that we have the utmost admiration and respect for our management group here at the home and the staff. We know that you, if you have a choice, are want to be a preeminent professional in what you do. You want to be the best, and we're here to facilitate that. We're here to work with you to build a culture in this company that fully respects who you are, acknowledges who you are, seeks in every way to contribute whatever we have to so that you can be preeminent in what you do. And when you sit down and have that kind of talk with people, you change their attitudes overnight, overnight. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and all of a sudden they start to think about the company very differently. And you tell them, look, when you've got any issue, I want you to come to me. I want you to tell me what it is and I will do everything in, earth, in my earthly power to help make that right for you, okay? And if they come to you with a problem with a supplier or they come to you with a problem with other members of their staff, then that's the point where you listen a lot and talk very little because they really don't want the answer. They want to be heard, okay? They want to know that they're respected, they're acknowledged. And a lot of times the answer can be simply, if this is a challenge, may I suggest that the two of you just sit down and talk about that, okay? And see if between you there's a way to handle this that works for both of you. And just that acknowledgement, that little bit of support, makes people feel really good about you, really good about the organization, and really good about the work that they're doing within that organization. So again, I'm trying to translate that for you into the franchisee. Yes. Does that make any sense to you? Do you see any parallel in that? Yeah, though no, that's resonating a lot. I think it's, uh, it's probably something we need to work on. In fact, I think since I've been here, there's quite a lot of, um, there's actually a lot of places and uh, courses we could do that would help the whole team with some of the stuff. Right. But the thing I want to know is, can you picture yourself sitting down with some of your franchisees mm -hmm. and having that conversation? Yes. Okay, and do you think that would resonate with them? Yes, yeah, oh, definitely. The, the, I think the thing is that the good ones we do that with, and right. the some of the franchisees I find scary. All right, <laughs> I know all right, now, let's, now, now let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. See, because you have a good model to work from, because you mm -hmm. do it already with the good guys. Yes. Now the yes, question is how you do it true. with the guys who aren't the good guys, uh, and make them into good guys. Yeah, okay? that's right. All and right. that is the communication. And look, right. I think what I've learned here in the last several days is that right. there's things that I need to work on to be right. better at that. But I think the problem really is within yourself if you think about it. Yes. Okay, because if you can translate what you already do with the good guys mm -hmm. into doing exactly the same with the guys that you don't see as so good, you'll find it'll have exactly the same response. Yes. Okay, yeah. and all of a sudden some of those not so good guys are going to become good guys. Yeah. And that's what you want. Yeah. See? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I think if you approach it with that, I think you might find it would work pretty well for you. Okay. All right. Well, Is that a good frame for us? Really good. All yeah, right. That's excellent. Great. Thank, Thank you so you. much. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So let's go ahead. Anything else you would like to say? Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Am I done? <laughs> you are done if you would like to be done, unless you want to share anything else. I have lots of stuff I can share. It's a question of well, how much time do we have? And you could have what. another 15 minutes. Do you want to do one more? We can do one more. It, anybody like to do one more? Okay. Let me just go get the little, I don't know why they call it a hat. We never really do it in a hat. Let me see if we can pick another woman. That would be fair. Yes. Yes. Okay, hold on. Can you hold this? Man, I even picked my sweetie. That would have been so unfair. Okay, right. Want to go? All right. Hey. Hi, Sally. Come into my parlor. I felt like I was hogging in because I had dinner last night, so I was trying to be nice. She, she tries to tell you I don't have good manners when I eat. Like Jeff, we're in the trades industry. We have mm. a building construction company on the Gold Coast. Mostly renovations, not too much commercial. This is the second time I've spoken in a microphone, so a bit nerve wracking. It's all right, just relax. But yes, that's about it. We're family based business. We've grown a lot in 12 months. We've been working with Kai Bison, they're our business coach. Mm. So we changed the structure, did all that. And yes, it's working, but still a lot of things missing. What's missing? Finding something that works for us in terms of structure and the the process from the lead coming in to the contact to the meeting, the initial contact to the meeting, and tracking that in a more confined space, which is why 
I resonated with Jeff a little bit in regards to everything's all over the place. We're using our accounting software to job track at the moment. We have an estimating tool that doesn't do exactly what we need it to. So we're all over the shop a little bit. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay. Do you belong to any trade associations? Do what, sorry? Do you belong to any trade association? Master builders, which okay. is, yeah. Are they a good trade association? Mm -hmm. What do they do for you as a trade association? Mm -hmm. Not much. Are there any other trade associations that you could be part of instead of that one? Not that I'm aware of, no. Our license falls under the QBCC, which mm -hmm. is the Queensland Building Association. But yeah, other than that's, I think that's about it. I might, am I right? You might know. Yeah, there's not a whole, there's not a lot of options. Okay, because normally, I'm talking now about the US, the states, really good trade associations really take a very deep interest in their members and they know that members have certain traditional problems in running their business and they put on symposiums and they put on different training programs to help their members to overcome those challenges and one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is because some of you may be part of businesses that have trade associations and most of the time you look at them as a pain in the neck that just bill you for their monthly fees or whatever it is and it would behoove everybody to take the time if you're a part of a trade association to find out what training programs they, they have especially that are industry specific a trade association that would put together a sales and marketing training for their members would tend to skew it towards what's true for people in your business because that's what everybody's coming from and so that way you would get training and, and system out of that could be very specific to your type of business and so instead of floundering around trying to create it yourself you start with one that already exists you try and make that work for you and then where it's not working you twist you tweak it and adjust it because I get the sense you're starting from scratch you're trying to you're just trying to put all these pieces together and they're coming at you left and right and up and down and what does this do where do I put that and what do I do with this and how do I move that from here to there and it's a nightmare for somebody who's just doing it without a, without grounding without a base if you're trying now you have a coach you said yeah. how are they working with you to get through this basically keeping us really on track with what our goal is on a yearly basis so we move through that and then if we're looking to exceed it or if things change then we reevaluate keeping this track i have weekly meetings with Beck in regards to making sure we're meeting our targets with leads and follow-ups and closing biz close of business and the rest of it mm -hmm. so that side if it wasn't for them like i would really be lost okay so they keep me in check okay now do you have any kind of a map that says here's the first thing i do this is the second thing we do then we do this then we do this then we do this then we do this and each one has contingencies that if certain things happen then you do the next thing I have a map in a way <laughs> it's more like a list we have we use my it's okay but at least it's something that keeps yeah. you on the track right you now we use monday.com just to keep track of that initial process and then when it becomes a job our guys use microsoft projects to track the actual job but okay now i'm going to give you a suggestion without having any clue if it'll work that's pretty brave right. that is. and this is something again i want to share with everybody i find that uh, as much as i don't particularly like google as an organization their service is incredible you can construct a request that if you can tune it to what your challenge is it'll take you right to a solution now it may not be the best solution it may not be it could make it if there's only one solution it may not even find it but it'll take you to a solution of some kind a lot of times in business the real challenge is that you have no guides whatsoever and you're winging it on your own instincts your own intuition trying to figure it out and you have no clue am i doing it right doing it wrong and it's just you're muddling through it it's terrible it's a hard thing to do it's better if you could take a bad solution and lay it down and then fix it to get it to where you want to be than to start with nothing and try to make some sense out of a whole bunch of things that don't make sense. And so if I had that problem, and this is what I would first do. Okay, let's say I have no idea how to solve this problem. Okay, so I would go on Google and I would put in something like system to do X, whatever X is, whatever you're trying to do. And I will guarantee you something will come up that somebody has a system or a method that has something to do with that. And a little bit of research will tell you what it is that is. Now you're not starting from ground zero. You have some points that you can say, this makes sense, this makes no sense. And it starts to come together as some kind of a, of a visual that you're starting to have of, I see some things that could work. So now you look at that, you take that out of the thing, you record that, you uh, save that page or whatever it is. And then you start asking complementary contingent questions. Until after a while, a pattern starts to emerge. You start to see, okay, there, here's what other people are doing. Here's other things that have solved that problem. Because the hardest thing you have to do is start with no concept of where to go. But once you see it falls into a pattern, then the pattern starts to manifest itself for you and you can start to work with it. And then where it doesn't work, you throw that out, you try something different there, and then when that one works, then you keep that and you go on to the next thing. But it sounds to me like you're trying to work from something where you really don't have any prerequisite. What did you do before you started the business? I was a mom. <laughs> you said that sheepishly. I got to tell you, moms are the most incredible people on the planet and keeps keep track of multitasking going on, things going on at the same time, distractions all over the place. I wouldn't be a mom for anything. I got to <laughs> tell you, that's a heck of an undertaking. So don't be sheepish about that. All right. So the point is, though, you don't have any track to run on. Okay. 
the, do you have any kind of a budget to work with to hire in somebody who that basically is a process or systems type person that would be a consultant that could say, I see these problems all day long. You need to do X, Y, and Z. And if you do these things, you'll capture what your needs are. You'll have a path to run on. And somebody like that could probably solve that problem for you pretty quick. Yeah, it was suggested to me by an associate before I left. Yes, I think that's probably the route we'll have to go down because yeah. we've been fumbling around and making do and spending more wasting money yeah. when you're not getting what you yeah, want. Yeah, there's, there's a problem anybody in business has, anybody, that no one else in business has ever had before. Okay, They're all a pattern and a com common to all businesses. There are people out there that specialize in that, and the only thing I would do when I hire somebody like that is I'm check reference, find out that other people like the results they've gotten with them. Okay, so that I can have some confidence that they're going to do a good job for me. And to bring in somebody to your business who that's their specialty. This is what they do. This is the kind of systemizing that they're accustomed to helping businesses put in. Because you can't start from nowhere and then hope to have something that's going to work for you. You've got to have a basic track to run on. Now, you adjust that track as it meets the needs of your business and what you have to do. But you, you need to get a basic track in there. And hiring a consultant for a short, very short time could probably fix that for you pretty quick. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. All right. Okay. Anything I was hoping somebody would have something existential to their business that if the world didn't open up with a solution, all hell was going to break loose because those are the things I love most. But we did great and I want to thank everybody who shared their, their challenge with us and hopefully we gave you some good insight into, into how to get through it and around it. So Gordon doesn't leave until tomorrow so you'll have dinner tonight with the group, right? Yes, I will. And so let's all just stand and give them a huge hand. Come on, you guys. Thank you. Thank you.